So hello everybody and good evening and thank you very much Vinayak and Sneha and Bharat for inviting me to give this talk on one of my passions for Bombay, the Esplanade Estate. So we're going to go straight into looking at what the Esplanade Estate was and why it came about and why the Khaki ad said this was the new Bombay. So everybody knows that Sorry, just a second, my slides won't move ahead. Yeah. So everybody knows that Bombay is made up of these seven islands. It's an archipelago. And the sprawling city that we know today, the Herbs Prima and Indus of the 19th century, began life right down here in this little southwestern corner, southeastern corner of the eight-shaped island of Bombay. And it was taken over by the East India Company, or rather leased to the British East India Company by Charles II, the King of Great Britain and Ireland. The directors of the East India Company had long coveted these islands because they had realized their worth as a very good natural harbor. The first governor of Bombay was Sir George Oxenden. He took charge of the islands in 1668, and it is he who began to secure the area and to encourage trade. Successive governors, notably Gerald Anger, who unfortunately we don't have a picture of, began to add to the settlement. And it was under Charles Boone, the governor of Bombay in 1715, that an actual walled town began. If you're looking at this, what we're seeing is the first fort that came up, the large fort that came up. The earliest fort is this small one here, the Bombay Castle. These are the large Bombay fort walls. They will be added to over a period of time. There will be a moat added in front of it. But this is, we're looking at um, east-west projection. North is this side. So if we're looking here, you're looking at VT Station. And this part down here, out, outside the Regal Cinema today. So to give you an idea of where exactly this fort stood. So at the same time, trade and industry were encouraged. Large numbers of people began to move into Bombay. So Bombay's transition into a major commercial hub begins when the first mill, so this is, sorry, I should have just specified, this is the fort in today's Bombay, if it actually had still stood. Unfortunately, all the walls are gone. So the first cotton mill comes to Bombay, was set up by Kavasti Nanamoy Dawar in 1854. It was set up at Tardev. We don't have a picture of it, but this is the Tata's Empress Mill at Nagpur, and this is what they would have looked like. And while the town was relatively untouched by the revolt of 1857, it meant that the power now transferred from the East India Company into the hands of the British Crown. And this is very, very important for Bombay for the simple reason that it is no longer now a small provincial capital under the East India Company, but directly under the Crown. It is an important link on their global trade network. And of course, it has to symbolize the power and might of the British Empire. Another very important event taking place at around this time is the American Civil War of 1861. And this meant a time of tremendous prosperity for the town and for its merchants. There was a huge amount of money in the cotton trade. These are cotton bales sitting at Colaba. Um, Indian merchants made a lot of money in cotton trading, in the speculation of shares. Many a fortune were built at this time. And it's in the middle of this economic boom that the then governor, Sir Henry Bartle Frere, decided that it was time to demolish the fort. The town inside had been cramped for a very long time. Many people had talked about demolishing the walls, but the natives of the fort, the people living within it, didn't want it to be demolished because they feared for their security. However, by this point of time, it has become very cramped, very crowded. There is a constant threat of fire, of disease. And it's also a time when Bombay has been linked um, with the rest of the country because of the Great Indian Peninsula railway line traversing the Borghat. So it's bringing in much greater opportunities of trade. It's bringing in huge numbers of immigrants. The fort itself is no longer required. 
It was built as a security fort to protect the commercial interests of the East India Company, but by the mid 19th century, it has become obsolete. Britain is the paramount power in India. Um, it's the paramount power on the seas. There is no real necessity for a defensive fort to protect Bombay. And on a space-starved island with this rapidly expanding population, land is a very valuable commodity. So this is from the report given by Sir William Mansfield, who was the commander-in-chief of the Bombay army um, in 1862. And you can see here, it says the peninsula is full to bursting. You need to undertake some new plan or remedy the overcrowding conservancy is they needed proper drainage, proper ventilation. The problem was that every monsoon, tens of thousands of people died because of cholera. So something needed to be done. So in 1862, despite opposition from the native residents of the fort, Sir Henry Bartle Frere gave the orders for the demolition of the ramparts. So a new Bombay would now rise from the dust of these demolished ramparts of the old fort town. Now, this very large, open, semicircular tract of land that stands outside the Bombay fort on the western part of the island was called the Esplanade. It was maintained as an open space and there were rules forbidding any building on this land. This was done in order to give the ordinance or the cannon on the ramparts of the fort a clear field of fire. So we have some pictures of what it looked like. So this is, you're looking from the church gate. This is the outer church gate. This is the inner church gate. And this is all the esplanade, the open esplanade. The moat of the fort is right here. And here again, you can see the ramparts, the moat, the guns, and the open esplanade. So people came out here for recreation in the evenings. There were military parades over here. In summers, it even provided temporary tented accommodation to the residents of the fort. So now if the fort was demolished, this land could be opened up for development. There could be renewed space for businesses, for private dwellings, for large public buildings, which have not been possible in the cramped environs within the fort. So the responsibility of the demolition of the fort and filling up its trenches was to be handled by the public works department and the army engineers. And the task of overseeing all this, as well as creating a new planned area in its place, was given to a newly set up committee called the Rampart Removal Committee. Now, this is the earliest of several agencies that would be responsible for the transformation of this area. So they laid out roads, they subdivided the area into plots for building. The idea was that some of these plots or a large number of these plots would be leased out and the money that was raised from that would enable the private funding, uh, would enable funding for the big public buildings. So along the old areas of the Esplanade comes up one of the city's most um, impressive urban development projects. It was going to be an area of commerce, of business, of entertainment, of education and government. There would now be commercial buildings, residential buildings, schools and large government buildings. So these could now symbolize the might and staying power of the Raj, apart from, of course, the very practical aspect of adding space to a land-starved town. Initially, it had been decided that the entire esplanade would be used up. All the land that was freed up from the ramparts, the ditch, all of it would be used for building purposes. But the directors in London were not in favor of this. And this, as you can see, is a letter to the Governor General and Council from the India office in London, where it very clearly says that you don't use up everything. You have to think about, uh, you know, the keep open land for the purpose of good health, for enjoyment. Um, you can see here, decided to do it with a, you know, a special plan, style and character of the buildings. And this last sentence is very important. An opportunity not likely to recur will now be afforded of building almost a new city in the island of Bombay and it may become a permanent subject of natural, national reproach if due advantage be not taken of the occasion. And so because of this, large tracts of land along the western foreshore were left open, and these became our four maidans of today, as you can see. They're still open like this. So Cooperage, Oval, Cross Maidan, and Azad Maidan. They were crisscrossed with big roads, but for the most part, they stayed open. So originally, 
the area was called Newtown. But the nomenclature changed after Sir Bartle Frere returned to England and it was now called Frere Town in honor of the man who had envisaged this new enclave beyond the constraints of the old walled town. So in modern geographical terms, Frere Town stretches from Crawford Market right here up till the Maharashtra State Police Headquarters near Regal in the south. So its eastern boundary, if we go from south to north, goes along uh, today's Mahatma Gandhi Road, which is originally the old Rampart Road, up to Flora Fountain. From there, it continues along what was called Hornby Row and Hornby Road, now DN Road. And this was Market, Esplanade Market Road, all the way up to Crawford Market. Um, the VT station, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Terminus, though it falls to the east of Dadabai Navroji Road, is also a part of Frere Town. The northern boundary lies along Lokmanya Tilak Marg, which was originally Esplanade Cross Road and then later on Karnak Road. Western boundary comes down Mahapalika Marg, which was Crookshank Road, meeting up with Wardby Road, which is now Hazarimal Somani Marg, coming down all the way to what was the old Mayo Road, now Karmavir Bhaurarao Patil Marg. And the southern boundary is at Cooperage. So if we look at it, the red part marked here, this is Frere Town. This is your crowded fort, though the walls are gone, you can still somewhat see a shape. And this is Frere Town outside it and the open medans beside it. So the sale of land, as it was called, began in 1864. Now the plots were not actually sold. What was sold was the lease to build upon the land. Government held all the land and the individuals purchased the lease. The, so the term sale is not strictly the correct term, but this is the term that government used at the time, not just in India, but also in their territories in Hong Kong and Singapore. So you had leases. The original leases started with 999 year leases, which then came down quite rapidly to 99 year leases. And the last few ones were 75 year leases. The government also drew up what were called conditions of sale that were very specific to this area. You don't find this elsewhere. So these conditions of sales were made part of the leases. All buildings that were built, even those that were bought by private buyers, had to be approved by the Rampart Removal Committee and by government. And very specific rules were brought in regarding style and height of the structure, the nature of the materials used, the fact that you had to have West Conservancy in all the buildings, as in uh, proper flushing toilets, which would join up with the main drains on the road. They put in a stipulation on time that buildings had to be completed within three years. And buildings for schools were given concessions in terms of money and also in the, con as well as in the conditions of sale. Now, contrary to popular belief, the entire fort didn't come down all at once. Two ramparts still, con uh, two ravelins still continued to stand. These would have fallen on DN Road. These are the Hodges and Cumberland ravelins. And the reason why they stood there still was because there were government offices in there. The PWD had offices in one and the pay and pension offices were in the other. And they took so much time in trying to decide where to shift these offices that the Ramblins actually stood there till 1888. And in fact, that's the reason why the northern part of the Esplanade estate took much longer to be uh, sort of divided up into various uh, plots and leased out. One important feature of the buildings that would be built on Hornby Road was arcaded pavements. So every building built along this major thoroughfare had to have arcades. These were created in order to protect the pedestrians from the hot summer sun as well as from the rain in the monsoon. And the condition was built into the leases and was very strictly enforced. Open spaces too were taken very seriously they were seen as requisites for hygiene and for the city um, and for the health of its inhabitants. And any sort of congestion in the area was frowned upon as it would prevent the free movement of breezes. So even here, if you look, there is space between the buildings. Now, this happened because when the government sold individual plots, and this we are looking at the plot that was taken by Nasarwanji Tata for Esplanade Mansion, so apart from giving them the plot that they sold, they also gave them two pieces of land on either side, free of cost, 
on the condition that it would not be built upon. So that it ensured that air moved from the sea towards the more crowded areas in the east. Apart from this, the reason that's the reason why the four maidans also stayed, even though at that time there were many who said the maidans should be used for rebuilding, should be used for development. So the four maidans are a legacy from our late 19th century. Our road system in South Bombay also is a legacy from this same period. So once the fort walls were demolished, plans for large new thoroughfares were put into place and every bit of it was specified the sizes of the main roads, the side streets, the alleys, the lanes, the pavements, who is going to plant the trees, who's going to maintain the trees. And you can see these roads and all the trees of the same size. All of this was put down. And lastly, there were many wells on the Esplanade. Now, because you were going to have the new piped water coming in from the Vihar Lake and the new system of drains coming in, those wells were all slowly covered up. So moving to our Hornby Road estate or the Esplanade estate. This is a plan of the Esplanade estate. This is now south, this is north. Um, to give you an idea, Flora Fountain is just on this side and VT Theatre uh, Station on this side. So the name Esplanade estate or Hornby Road estate comes from the Bombay Improvement Trust and it is part of Frere Town. It's a very roughly trapezium shaped plot um, that's sort of closed on one side, on the eastern side by our Hornby Road, which is today Dadabai Roji Road. And on the western side, you have Esplanade Road, which is Mahatma Gandhi Road. And then, of course, Warnby Road, which is today Hazarimal Somani Mark. It has 65 late 19th and early 20th century buildings. They have no uniform style of architecture, but are mostly neo-Gothic and neoclassical in style. Now they have mainly commercial and business buildings, but a large number of residential buildings existed there. So there were schools, there were theaters, there was a cricket club, there was a racket court, there was a hospital. Most of these are still there. Now, um, for those of you who were listening to Vinayak's talk the other day, this is Ravelin Street and this is Bastion Road, named for the Ravelins that actually stood here and the Bastions that would have been behind it. So the growth of the Esplanade estate didn't take place as fast as the government thought it would. It took over five decades. Buyers did not snap up the plots very quickly, even though there was money in the market, it didn't go that fast. And government also on their part were not willing to simply give them away at very low prices. Um, they took great interest in ensuring that the vision with which they had begun this exercise remained more or less true. So since we cannot go through all 65 buildings, we're just, I'm just going to take you through a kind of broader look at its growth and development. Now, the first set of land sales took place on the 26th of August, 1864. Notices were put out in all the newspapers, both vernacular and English, and Bennett and Company was hired to run the auction. But sales were not as productive as had been expected. Um, a large number of plots didn't get sold and only an average of around 95 rupees per yard was per square yard was obtained. Now the first plots to be sold in 1864 is this area on the northern Hornby Road. Um, they were plots numbers one to five. They're located on the northeastern fringe right here. If this is Capitol Cinema today, you get an idea of where they are. I'll show you pictures. Um, they were sold for very large sums of money. All five of them became private residences. Um, even though all of them were equal in size, this is only showing one. There were five separate plots in this area. If you can look down here, you'll see their sizes. Um, they fetched between 90 rupees and 113 rupees per square yard. This is the highest prices that you will see them being sold at. So plot number one was sold to Mr. Katao Kimji for 73,025 rupees, which was the highest rate per square yard of land sold in this area, 113 rupees per square yard. Unfortunately, all the original buildings on this stretch, the five buildings have gone and commercial buildings came up in the early 20th century. So if you look at them, these are the five buildings. This is plot number five, Shukravar building. Unfortunately, demolished many years ago, 
the plot stood empty for very very long but recently a new building has is has come up in its place and i was very thrilled to see that they have actually kept the same design so the front facade is exactly as it used to be bisanya building on plot number 4 was a ne beautiful neoclassical building it is very very lovely you can still see it there unfortunately it is in a terribly dilapidated state has been lying empty for many years this is bible house on plot number 3 also quite dilapidated also in the neo gothic style also sitting empty unfortunately this building on plot number 2 was the original gt school Gop uh, gokuldas tejpal school unfortunately the building was broken down and there is now a very modern building in its place that is the aditya birla world school and plot number 1 the espl originally it was called the esplanade school building it now houses offices it's still there till today also sold at auction in 1864 on the same one were plots numbers 29 and 35 on wadby road they stood on opposite sides of a large open plot that would later on become the cathedral chaplain's quarters they were bought at 90 rupees and 85 rupees per square yard respectively and private residences were built on them for a short time they became hotels then they were converted back again to private residences this is the building on plot number 29 dadi set house it was demolished and is now godrej bhavan and the building on plot number 35 is now tcs house so here you're seeing tcs house it was at one time rali's house this is the cathedral chaplain's quarters and you can just about see dadi set house over here on the side the prices that these plots fetched in 1864 would never again be repeated after this the price ranged between 25 and 30 rupees per square yard and the most that a plot fetched was in 1897 when it fetched 50 rupees a square yard so the frere fletcher school was one of the earliest school buildings built in this area <clears throat> sorry Originally it was the girls branch of the Fort Christian School and it was set up by the Reverend W K Fletcher who was the chaplain of St Thomas's Cathedral it was administered by Miss Mary Prescott so land for the school was granted by the governor Bartle Frere in 1865 and the building was raised through funds given by Premchand Roychan the original building designed by Walter Paris and George Twig Molsey still stands the school's name was changed in 1920 to the new high school for girls and in 1942 it took its current name the jb petit high school for girls this large area in the middle of the um, estate was the mews <clears throat> now mews were kind of like a parking garage for horses and carriages and the idea for setting up a mews had come up in 1868 was brought up by the architectural improvements committee this was the successor of the rampart removal committee but they didn't have enough funds and so the idea had been shelved but by 1870 the idea was again revived by the then architectural executive engineer and surveyor lieutenant john augustus fuller he felt that a large number of these public buildings were coming up on the edges of the esplanade and there was need for stabling the horses and carriages and so they decided that a mew should be built and in 1873 the plans were passed hardly had this happened when there was a whole flurry of letters sent to the governor with uh, jamshed ji ji boy taking the lead in asking that the mews not be located in this area of the esplanade as they would be and i quote a grievous nuisance that the problem was that since they are living on this side inside the fort the breezes are coming in from the sea over here um, the worry was that it would carry in a lot of the smells so as he says it would uh, interfere with the fullest enjoyment of their property so he asked the governor to consider setting up the mews at some other spot but uh, the government were not too inclined to change it they assured the petitioners that they would not the mews would not be a hazard to cleanliness and to the sanitation horses would only be stable during the day and by 7 o'clock in the evening everything would be cleaned up and the mews would be properly drained into the hornby road sewer 
Um, and regarding the closing off of the wind, the governor reminded them that they had had really large port walls that blocked their breeze uh, quite regularly. These walls were only going to be 18 feet in height, so they should not be any kind of obstruction. So the mews were completed in January of 1876, and the government fixed a rental fee of one rupee per month per stall. Now, in 1898, this area came under the newly formed Bombay Improvement Trust, and the vacant lands on the Esplanade estate were to be handed over to the trust, and they would then sell it, and they would that was how the trust would get money. So they included the general mews, because this is such a large plot of uh, land. So the mews would be demolished, and they would be moved to another site, and the trust would now build the new mews. But this was not so easy because by 1898, almost all the land in South Bombay has been taken up. There is no real space to build a large news like this. So finally, in 1907, they decided that the uh, PWD engineer stores, which were inside the news, would remain there in that area and that the trust would not build any other news. They would instead allow people to stable their horses worked up a deal with the Tatas who had just set up Wellington News. So today we still have the PWD engineers offices in this area. There was a very pretty two-story building inside it. However, some years ago it was broken down and a very large building has been built in that space. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people were not very willing to go to the Wellington Mews because now instead of one rupee per month, they were going to have to pay a concessional rate of eight rupees per month. Three other schools came up on the southern part of the Esplanade between 1877 and 1878. The Alexandra Native Girls English Institution, the Cathedral Boys High School, and the John Connon School. The Alexandra Native Girls Institution was set up by Manikji Kharsidji in 1863 for the education of native girls. Now, it had been a dream of his. He did a lot of very good work for girls' education and was discussing setting up a school uh, with the British authorities when his oldest son passed away. And at the Uthamna ceremony of the, his son, he asked the gathered sympathizers to help with this cause, and many people contributed to set up the Alexandra School. So it started out on a very small scale from his home, Villa Baikala in Baikala, and it was, of course, named after the new bride of the Prince of Wales, Princess Alexandra of Denmark. Now, in April 1865, Mr. Karseji wrote to, the, uh, to Governor Bartle Frere asking for a more permanent site to build a building for the school. He had managed to raise 25,000 rupees to contribute towards building a permanent schoolhouse, and he was looking for a site on the Esplanade. So a plot was give, designated for him on Esplanade Market Road. Now, if you see this, this would be our JJ School of Arts today, so you get an idea about where it would be. Um, but nothing happened for the next decade. In 1875, Mr. Karseji again wrote to government asking them to allow Man, uh, Mancherji Kawasji, who would later on become Khan Badu Mancherji Kawasji Marzban, who was an assistant engineer in the PWD at the time, to design a building for the school. So the request was sanctioned. Then in 1877, Mr. Karseji now requested government please change exchange this site for one that is further south because he felt this was not a very suitable locality for the young women who would be attending the school so a new site was duly sanctioned this time on the esplanade road so a very beautiful neo-gothic building was designed for the school by mancherji kawasji it was built over there this is the alexandra school's original building exceedingly beautiful unfortunately demolished Two stone arches are all that remain of this building. The Oriental buildings stand on a very prominent site at the southern end of the Esplanade estate. This is the southernmost plot of the area and it commands a very uh, important position of standing on the confluence of two major roads, Esplanade Road and Hornby Road. So the site had been offered to a bank in 1868, but government was insisting on 100 rupees per square yard and the bank had refused. But in 1878, when the committee of the Cathedral High School applied for a site to build their boys' school, it was granted to them at a very nominal rent. 
and a very beautiful building was built over here. This is the original Cathedral Boys School. But within a few years, the school committee was not very happy with this location because they felt it was very noisy and distracted the boys. And so they asked the government if they could sell this building and be granted two locations on the Esplanade estate, not on such prominent sites. So the Cathedral High School shifted out of this building and sold it to the Oriental Life Assurance Company, hence the name Oriental Buildings. The Oriental Life Assurance Company changed the existing structure and added another floor on it. Um, so you can see this here. This is the side view of it. Very, very beautiful structure. And the Cathedral Schools Committee were given another plot further south further north, sorry, on the Esplanade, and a new building was constructed for them there. This is the old Cathedral Boys School. Now it is today the Cathedral and John Common Senior School. An additional plot of land opposite the J.B. Pettit School, the Frere Fletcher School, was also granted. This became the Cathedral Girls School. This is its original building. Today, of course, it is the Cathedral and John Common Middle School. In 1877, the Scottish Orphanage Society and the Scottish Education Society petitioned government for a parcel of land to construct a building for a school that they used to run out of rented accommodation in the fort. In April 1878, government granted the school a site slightly to the west of the Flair Frere Fletcher School right here. Miss Prescott actually petitioned government saying, please don't give this to anybody because it is going to block our air. But uh, this was not done and work on the school building designed by John Adams started in 1878, was completed by 1881. It was called the John Connon School. When the cathedral schools and the John Connon School merged in 1922, this building became the junior school of the cathedral and John Connon schools. So from the southernmost, we move to the northernmost plot on the Esplanade estate. This was the Gaiety Theatre. Kuwarji Nazar had been a lessee of the Grand Road Theatre that Vinayak spoke about in his talk, but he had given it up and he wanted to set up a new theatre on the Esplanade. So he had raised 30,000 rupees and he wanted to build, and I quote, an elegant and commodious auditorium capable of seating 1,000 persons. So he asked government to give him a plot on the Esplanade around 3,000 square yards, and it was going to be a very beautiful a large building with a promenade and a carriage drive. So the government granted him a site on Hornby Road at 12 annas per square yard per annum rent. So it was not an outright lease. This worked out to 2,250 2, rupees per annum rent. So the original building for the theater was designed by the architect John Campbell, but this was not a permanent structure and the property changed hands several times until the current building, designed by the architect Arthur C. Payne, was completed by Chotalal Mulchand. In 1926, the Globe Theatre Company of Calcutta rented the Gateway Theatre and converted it to a cinema hall. It opened under the name Capitol Cinema on 20th of January, 1929. In October of 1881, Nastaranji Tata made an offer for a plot of land immediately to the north of Alexandra School on the Esplanade, offered government 25 rupees per square yard for it. Now, this was not one plot, but actually three separate plots. He wanted to build one large family home across the three plots. So John Fuller, who was now Major General and the Superintending Engineer of the Northern Division, didn't want to give up three plots to make one house because he felt that was going to then block the ventilation of the buildings behind this structure. However, government allowed Nasarwanji to buy the three plots, but at 30 rupees a square yard. Not only did he get permission to build his house across three plots, he also was given the full amount of free land uh, as garden space. So he got two strips of 30 yards on both sides of his plot, which is why even today, if you see it, there is a lot of space on the side on both sides of Esplanade Mansion. So this is the very beautiful house that was built there. Esplanade House or Esplanade Mansion is still there, beautifully restored, no longer a Tata residence. 
Nasarwanji and Jamshedji also purchased the plot directly to the north of this plot, reserving for themselves the right to construct when they wished rather than the stipulated three years. The reason for this being that they didn't want a building coming up there very soon close to their home. In 1892-93, Jamshedji built the Jimkhana chambers over there. Jimkhana chambers were sold in 1920. It is now called Srinivas building and the original building, you can't see it anymore. Just to give you an idea, this is Jamshedji's house, Esplanade Mansion. These are the Bombay Jim Khanna racket ports. These were private residences. This was Mr. Abraham Shuker's recluse. And this building is now Trafford House. It's, this is now DBS House. This is now Trafford House. It still stands. It was the residence of uh, J. Gerson de Kunad the gentleman who wrote about the history of Bombay. This is the Parsi lying in hospital here. You can just see the muse on the corner over here. In October of 1883, Jamshedji Tata bought this plot number 16 on Hornby Road, immediately to the north of the Cathedral Boys High School. So a building was designed by Messrs. Gosling and Morris Architects, was completed in 1888. Very, very beautiful building named Albert Building. It was office spaces. The Times of India actually ran its press from here for a little while. This is Albert Building today. They've added on two more floors. It is now Siddharth College and the Anand Bhavan of Siddharth College. Next to Albert Building and the stand, uh, stand the Standard Buildings. In May 1884, the Standard Life Assurance Company applied to government for a plot of land where they wanted to build their offices. And so they were given uh, plot number 58 at 30 rupees per square yard. This building was also designed by Gosling and Morris and was, it was touted by government as, and I quote, an example of the style of new buildings to be erected on the west side of Hornby Row, north of the Cathedral High School. Today, like many buildings on the Esplanade, um, on the old Esplanade estate, it belongs to the Life Insurance Corporation of India. So here you can see the cathedral school. We have the Albert building and the standard buildings behind it. Now, Khan Bahadur Mancherji Kawasri Marzban had served as executive engineer presidency in the PWD for many years. Many of the buildings in this area were built by him. He designed quite a few of them as well. And Marzban Road actually is named after him. So, he was um, the plots to the south uh, to the south of the racket courts were finally sold between 1883 and 1893. They were all residential buildings. I showed you a couple of them, and included Mancherji's own home, Gulista, built on plot number 57. Unfortunately, this very beautiful building has also been demolished in 1920. A new building designed by Gregson, Batley and King Architects was built on the plot, uh, completed in 1922. It is still called Gulistan after Mancherji's wife and is also an LIC building. Another theater that came up here was the Novelty Theater. It was a temporary theater right here, all the way on the north, uh, set up in 1887 across from the Municipal Corporation building. But in 1890, the government decided that it needed to be pulled down because it was too close. It's dangerous vicinity to the new municipal offices. So the proprietor of the Parsi theatrical company that functioned from the novelty theater, Mr. Kharsedji Merwanji Baliwala, asked government to grant another site on the Esplanade in lieu of the one they had to vacate. So Khan Badu Mancherji Marzban suggested the site across from the Fort Gratuitous Dispensary on the south side, and this was granted. In 1906, when the land came under the Bombay Improvement Trust, Mr. Baliwala made plans to build a larger, more permanent theater on that plot. This plot had now become two plots. Instead of just being 86, it would be 85 and 86. So initially in 1905, the plans for the novelty theater were prepared by the architects, Messrs. Mistri and Bedwar, and even passed by the Improvement Trust. <clears throat> Sorry, but in June 1906, Mr. Baliwala submitted new plans prepared by Arthur C. Payne, who had also uh, designed the K. 
KT theater. And this is the novelty theater. It gave way to the Excelsior. And finally, this too was demolished and a new cinema hall and office building were constructed on the property sometime in the 1970s. So this is your new Excelsior cinema. Now, this is a very beautiful building on the Esplanade Estates, one of my personal favorites. This is the Parsi Lying in Hospital, popularly known at one time as Temulji Nu Suavad Khamen. So Dr. Temulji Bhikaji Nariman was running a very small lying in hospital for the postnatal care of Parsi women, along with a committee of philanthropic Parsis who helped to fund and run the institution. So in 1889, the committee approached the government with a request to grant some land for the hospital at a reduced rate so that they could build a larger building where there would be more beds and more charity beds. Finally, in 1891, government decided to grant them plot number 79 across from the Bombay Jinkhana racket courts and in line with the Cathedral Boys High School. Um, it was given to the committee at half the market value. So Manchirji Marzban offered to design a building for the hospital free gratis. He designed this beautiful building, which was completed in 1895. It had a very grand opening ceremony by the governor of Bombay, then Lord Harris in 1895. It was in use till the 1980s, but unfortunately now lies defunct. These are some of its very beautiful stone jalis over there. In February of 1892, Messrs. Laidlaw and Whiteway of Calcutta, who ran a very large store in Calcutta, made an offer for two plots on Hornby Road at the rate of 30 rupees a square yard. These were plots 62 and 63. Their offer was accepted and a building designed by Gosling and Morris was completed in 1897. This was the large department store, Whiteway, Laidlaw and Company. This later became the Khadi Bandar. Uh, it had office space on the upper floors. It was a very beautiful, imposing building. Um, unfortunately, also now owned by the LIC, has been renamed G Jeevan Udyog. I say unfortunately because when LIC was celebrating its 60th anniversary in 2016, it decided to paint all these lovely stone buildings it held on the Esplanade Road on Hornby Road. And so this absolutely stunning gray basalt and white limestone building is now in yellow mango ice cream shades, as is the Sun Life of Canada building around the corner. Plot number 38 on Wardby Road, you might have seen this, had been put up for sale by tender in 1884, but nobody was buying that plot. Finally, in 1892, it was reserved for the Free Church of Scotland. The Scotch Free Church, sometimes called the Scotch Kirk, was run by Scottish missionaries in the vicinity of the GT Hospital near Crawford Market. But in 1886, they asked government for a new plot on the Esplanade, um, either free or below the market rate. Um, they wanted to shift, and I quote, because the position of their church in the neighborhood of the Gokuldas Hospital has become very objectionable. They didn't mention how and why. But anyway, in 1892, they settled on plot number 38, which was given to them at 25 rupees per square yard with a rent of one anna per square yard per annum. Work started in June of 1898 and was completed by the end of the year. It is now called the Presbyterian Church of St. Andrew and St. Columba. Unfortunately, it's very beautiful steeple has gone. The J.N. Pittit Library stands on plot number 61 on Hornby Road. Now, this was a corner plot of some value, but had never been, had never got much interest in the earlier sales. The Fort Reading Room and Library was set up by Bai Dinbai Pittit, who was the widow of Nasarwanji Manikji Pittit, and she had wanted to set up a permanent library in memory of her late son, Jamshidji. So in May of 1884, the secretary of the Fort Reading Room and Library asked government if they would be willing to lease them plot 61. However, if the Reading Room and Library could sublease half of it. The government denied this because they didn't want to break up the plots. So plot 61 went on um, auction again in December of 1894, 
finally, Jamshedji Tata bought it at 38 rupees per square yard. But um, there was some deal struck between the, the secretary of the Fort Reading Room and Library and Jamshedji Tata, and he gave them the plot free of cost. So work on the building began in May 1895 and was completed again by 1898. And this is the beautiful building that came up in its place, the Jamshedji Nasarwanji Pitit Institute or the JN Pitit Institute and Library. They've also added on a floor and their roof, like all the other roofs in this area, also has uh, come down. Plots number 17 and 18 on Esplanade Road had been reserved for offices of the Bombay Baroda and Central India Railway Company, the BBNCI Railway. But in 1889, the BBNCI Company decided that they needed offices closer to the Churchgate Station. So this plot was lying vacant. And in 1897, the Chartered Bank of India, Australia and China put in tenders for the two plots offering rupees 50 per square yard. So this is the next highest price that you will get. Government accepted the offer and the directors of the bank employed Frederick William Stevens to design a building for them in the classical Renaissance style, which they felt was, and I'm quoting, better adapted for banking purposes than any other style of architecture. Building was completed in 1903 and is still the offices of the bank. It is now the standard chartered bank. Um, in 1969, the Chartered Bank of India, Australia, and China merged with the South African Standard Bank to become Standard Chartered. Now, the Bombay City Improvement Trust was set up in 1898 in order to improve the health and sanitation of the city after the plague of 1896. So the need was felt for a separate body that would take charge of the demolition of unsanitary buildings, create new roads and open breezy residential areas in order to prevent such epidemics in the future. Yes, ironic, I know. To finance these schemes, government handed over some of their own lands. So these would then be sold and the monies generated from the sale of leases would enable the trust to carry out its work. So one of the areas granted was the Esplanade Estate. So it's in fact, as I told you earlier, under the Bombay Improvement Trust that the name Onby Road Estate and later Esplanade Estate was given to this area. So plot number 19 had been kept vacant for military offices, but these never materialized. So in 1902, when the Bombay Improvement Trust began to find their offices in Albert Building too small, they decided they needed their own building. And so this plot was given to them. They started building a very beautiful neo-Gothic building. This was designed by C.F. Stevens, F.W.'s son. And in 1909, they added on a second floor. So this second floor got added on in 1909. This building was, of course, given over to the Municipal Corporation when the Bombay Improvement Trust was merged with the Municipal Corporation in 1933. It is today the BMC's Atma Singh, Jasa Singh, Bake Bihari Ear, Nose, Throat Hospital. But it is undergoing restoration. What you are seeing here is the picture of it being restored. And just recently, I saw that they are adding on the turret at this end also. So it is looking very, very beautiful. So between 1898 and 1907, all the available land on the Esplanade Estate had been leased out. In all, 19 plots were developed. These were mainly on the North Hornby Road and in the central part of the Esplanade Estate. The reason why this area stayed was because, remember, those ravelins were still around. So the buildings that came up here included buildings like Saratan Tata's residence, which was popularly called Tata Palace. You have the large Empire Theatre and Empire Building, which later on became the New Empire Cinema. And by 1910, the entire Esplanade Estate had been built upon. So I'm going to take you through some photographs. It's now going to be a pictorial journey of the Esplanade Estate. This is the area we're talking about, being slowly going from this open land to a very built up 65 building populated area. So this is, if you look here, these are the buildings on plots numbers one and five. This would have been where the fort walls came originally, and these are the crowded buildings inside the fort. Here again, we're looking, this is the Flora Fountain and you're seeing the Esplanade here. This would be the building, Dadi Set House and the Raleigh's building at the back over there. 
a clearer view. You can see it's almost all open still. Now here we are. The cathedral school is built. Behind it here you have the Frere Fletcher School and on the side you have the small cathedral and John Connon School. Here again, you can see the John Cronin School, Cathedral School. You cannot see J.V. Pitted very clearly, but it is just right here at the back. Now here we're looking at our Maidan. So that's our Oval Cross Maidan, Azad Maidan. And here is our Esplanade Estate. The Oriental buildings are done. This is Albert Building. You can see many, many, many more buildings in the area. That's Gymkhana Chambers. This is a picture, of course, from the Rajabai Clock Tower as well. Now we're here much more congested area, oriental buildings. This is our DN road going down. This very congested area, the standard chartered building has also come up. And here we are. This is what it looks like today. Actually, this is a picture from the 1920s when your back bay reclamation has just started. To get an idea of the area we're talking about, this is it. This is the Esplanade Estate completely built up. So Frere Town is considered to be one of the largest enclaves of neo-Gothic architecture outside of London. And side by side with the art deco of the Back Bay Reclamation, it forms one of the most unique precincts in the world. And in fact, we have recently just got our UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2018. But the Esplanade Estate is under threat. These are the private buildings, not the public buildings. In uh, 1995, the DN Road was designated the Heritage Mile. And despite this, in 2015, the buildings on the Esplanade Estate were denotified from Grade 2A and they were moved to, to Grade 3, which means that they can be redeveloped. If they are um, decrepit and falling apart, they can be broken down. And think about it, that on an island like Bombay, land is always going to be a very precious commodity. And at some point, someday soon, someone will decide that maintaining these buildings is just too expensive, that the needs of the populace are greater. And we may very well lose them forever, like we have lost York House. Um, York Building was demolished in 2016. The owners had gone to court. The Heritage Committee went to court, but unfortunately, it was declared to be dangerous and it was brought down literally overnight. Today, there's an even greater threat to many of the buildings here, particularly those on DN Road, from the underground metro station that is being constructed parallel to these structures. They never had very deep foundations to begin with, and the dynamiting and the stone breaking has to have had an impact on their stability. The historian F.W. Maitland said, what is now in the past was once in the future. And Frere Town, along with the Esplanade Estate, was once the precursor of a shining future of Bombay. However, today, these have become the last vestiges of our past. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Poncha, on that amazing talk. This is the third time I'm attending it, and it's always a delight to, you know, go through those pages and, uh, you know, talk about those maps as well. So uh, we've got quite a few questions come in as well. So uh, yeah. let me start by taking them one on by one. Uh, the first one is by Bharat. He mentions that even Mombasa and Karachi have a fair town. Is there? Yes, yes, of course. Karachi has a fair town, but it was not built up the way Bartle Frere decided to, you know, sort of leave his mark here on Bombay. And Mombasa's fair town actually started out as a very small little enclave where um, slaves on British, uh, the British had sort of. Um, saved from Portuguese ships were given a place to stay. And since Bartle Frere had done a lot of good work, I want to say stellar work on trying to get rid of slavery in England, uh, they named that enclave Frere Town. So it's actually a part, it started out as a separate area where the slaves, now free sla uh, people, actually lived. So yeah, that's how we have the two other Frere Towns. There's a Frere Mountain and Frere Lake. There's a lot of things named after him. But um, the, this seems to be the only place where he seems to have, you know, created this entirely 
you know, grand enclave. And it's, it's done on purpose. There, there's no denying that. I mean, just look at it. And the picture you're seeing right now also, it's, it's just quite amazingly beautiful. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Kunal Desai. Uh, he's basically just checking. Is the Esplanade House and the Tata Palace the same building? No, they're two separate buildings. Uh, Esplanade House was Jamshedji's house, Nasarwanji and Jamshedji's house. And uh, Tata Palace is further down, just behind Sterling Cinema. It's very large, very beautiful. Now, of course, Deutsche Bank building. And of course, maybe sold again. Uh, question from Kaivan. Uh, did the Elphinstone Land Company have any role in this area? Not that I've come across at all. They may have given uh, money. If I'm not mistaken, something happened with one of the later buildings under the Bombay Improvement Trust, but I haven't really come across anything with the Elphinstone Land Company. No. Okay. Um, another question uh, that's from Ankur. He's basically very uh, enthralled by the fact that uh, LIC owns so many lovely buildings. So how did they get to own them? And in the current scenario, if they're in doldrums, what's the future of these? They got to own them very easily because these were mostly insurance buildings. And uh, on nationalization of the LIC, the, or the creation of the Life Insurance Corporation of India, these buildings came to the LIC. Um, they don't really look after them. I, I don't want to be very rude over here, but um, they sometimes don't value what they have. There, there is so much opportunity here to restore these buildings, save them, at least not paint them yellow. But they thought they were doing something nice. But unfortunately, the buildings are in a shabby state. LIC also complains because they're getting very small rents because of the rent, uh, you know, the freeze on rents, they're not getting much money at all. So these buildings are money pits. You need a lot of money to restore them. And as you keep wasting more time, it gets worse and worse until you're in York building's condition where there's no choice but to break it down. It's really, really sad. Uh, uh, another question that comes in from Perina. Uh, many of the buildings have Indian elements like Jali's. Uh, was there a reason for this style or uh, was it mandatory to use these elements? No, it wasn't. Uh, they, while they kept insisting that there should be, uh, you know, they should be very architecturally beautiful buildings. That's one of the things they want. They want them to look nice. There is no specific style that they're insisting on. Now the jalis and verandas are of course very much part of the architecture that develops here in India with the British buildings because that allows for breeze to move through. Even if you look at all the big buildings that you can see down the Institute of Science or say the High Court, they have these huge large verandas because you want the breeze to move in and out of the building. Today, unfortunately, of course, a lot of them are being closed up and, you know, AC is coming all over the place. But that was the idea behind the jalis and the veranda. Yes. Right. Uh, th this is a question from me, actually. It's been bothering me for quite a while. So the branch of the Siddharth College, which is next to the Parsi lying in hospital, uh, if you look at that structure, two older names also written over there. Yeah. So idea what they were named? I find Carlton House. I've read Carlton House over there. Um, I couldn't read the other one. The other one really seems to have sort of um, it been scrubbed in, but one day we could really go all the way up there and try and see it. Yeah, Carlton House, but that's also a Tata building. Okay. That was their offices. Yeah, a large number of Tata buildings, which were all then given away. Navsari building um, also was a Tata building. They were then leased out again to others. Or sold. Uh, so there's one question. Uh, what's the best uh, difference between a bastion, a ravelin, and a lunette? Okay. Um, can I go backward in this to show you the pictures? Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. Okay, we're just going to escape this and do it. Is my screen sharing? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Yeah, okay. Okay, so these are bastions. They belong to the curtain wall. So these are 
two angular walls that come out of the curtain walls, the main walls of a fort, so that your uh, guns can fire in all directions. Ravelins get added on later on. They are separate triangular shapes to give you even further. And they come in the middle. So can you see? So your guns now have every direction of firing, but they will not fire back by any mistake on your own fort. Um, we do have a lunette somewhere here, here, Queen's lunette, another small part of the wall, um, enabling your large guns to be aimed in a certain direction to cover all fields. So you get that 360, I mean, 180 degree almost uh, field of fire. I hope that explains it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, another question from Sneha. Uh, why weren't the planning guidelines such as keeping wider space around buildings or arcades for all buildings continued later on? Ah, that's um, anyone's guess. One is, of course, space restrictions. I mean, just look at this roads. If you see the roads that are being made at that point of time, when you know you have hardly any traffic, if you just see that this one here, you know these roads, this road. Look at this, but um, unfortunately now it's all about space and we jam everything into tiny areas. We no longer have this restriction. FSI was created in order to ensure that there would be proper, you know, air movement of air between buildings, but that longer being used. Um, the, the, there's another problem also, this is very organic if you look at it. This kind of um, additions of sales put into the leases, etc., don't exist that much anymore. Even though we do have rules, the housing rules are there, the bylaws are there, they're not very often followed. And it all boils down to land being worth its weight in gold here in Bombay. It's, it's just as simple as that. It's very, very sad, but that's the case. All right. Uh, there's a question which is a combination of Arnaz and Ashwin's question. Basically, uh, there are nine busts. Uh, that are there on the facade of the Oriental Building, three on each side. Any idea who are these nine? No, I don't know who they are. They were on the old um, sort of school building. Can you see them here? There's yeah. two in the front. There would have been 11 because there are four, four and two. And they have been replaced into this three, three and three. But no, I don't know. And as you have seen one, this one over here and have decided he Shakespeare, he does look like Shakespeare. So yeah, probably um, somebody to do with learning because it's not in the original plans of the building. They have not written whose faces they were putting there, whether they were people on the committee, whether they were, you know, chaplains in the church. I really don't know. I have not been able to find anything that specifies who they are. And two chaps per chap have been discarded also. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is what comparisons look like. One can probably be a Socrates, yeah. and the other being the yeah, dance. yeah, you're right. Closest yeah, way. so kind of you know somebody in the field of knowledge that way. Uh, the next question is uh, from Ashwin. Uh, Most buildings along Dian Road have an extended portion at the terrace that looks like the top of a church bell tower. Was this a guideline for all buildings? No, it wasn't a guideline, but they had to stay within a certain height. So you weren't allowed to build above uh, a certain height. So that is why you see almost all of them barring Gymkhana chambers, which sort of went up a little bit further at the back. But the main DN road, they had to be of one height. They were trying to create this at least, if not identical look, then a very uniform look. Um, most of them did. If you look here, you can see some of the spire-like things. A lot of them, unfortunately, have collapsed or fallen down. These would have been wooden structures. And if you're not maintaining the building, even Taj building had a cupola. Um, it's gone now. They don't uh, sort of manage to remain if you don't look after them. But no, there was no requisite, uh, no requisite item that you had to have it. Uh, there's another question, not directly linked to the estates, but uh, from Harini, that is there a particular reason why an old chunk of Fort St. George is still around? <laughs> uh, aren't we glad, Harini, that it's still there? Um, 
I do not know why it just stayed. It has stayed. It is actually a government office. So very much like those poor ravelins that hung around forever because you couldn't move the offices. Perhaps that's exactly what happened here. It is the Directorate of uh, Archaeology and Museums of, for the Maharashtra State. And uh, so it's still there. I find it very, very sad that when the fort was demolished, they could not even keep one gate you know, just there as, I mean, if you've got Flora Fountain, you could have had the gate over there. But uh, I feel very sad that every last bit of it was broken up and thrown away into the sea to build more land. Yeah. So no, that's that's the only reason I can think of. I, I haven't come across anything as to why it stayed. Uh, question from Kanishk, uh, how and when were, uh, with respect to this areas, drainage and sewers built uh, at the same time around the same time yeah in the 1860s in the late 1860s um, when they started building this the idea of drains and sewers were also uh, drains even water pipes so we are lake but because of that they shut off all the wells which was a very big problem not all of them were shut off right at once you can actually see even in my um, if you look here this is a well this is a well this is a well in fact this tata palace property didn't get sold for the longest time because there were three wells on it and they didn't know what to do with them, close them or leave them open. So um, it came up around at the same time. And there's a second part to his question. Uh, where would they actually drain out to or get processed? The drains go out into our main drains, the ones we have still use even today. It's the same drains that we are using, the same water pipelines and the same drains that we are using today are those drains. They can go all the way up to Love Grove pumping station, the drains. Uh, a little bit more on the Ford Gratuitous Dispensary. Yeah, which I left out this time. Sorry. Yeah. The Ford Gratuitous Dispensary is, a, I don't have a picture with me here today, but it's a really beautiful little building right here. Uh, uh, the money was given by Ardesha Pawala to set up a small dispensary for a charitable dispensary for people who lived in the fort. And it was again designed by. Uh, you know, Khan Badur Manjiri Marzban is a very beautiful little building. If you're at uh, New Excelsior Cinema, just uh, the one right across the road from there. Very sweet, very beautiful little building there. Um, he used to have it inside the fort. He found the rents in the fort were too high. So he asked government to give him this property, which they gave him at a very nominal rent. All right. Uh, question by Suyash. Uh, are any major efforts uh, on byway for litigation or otherwise to save or maintain these structures? Um, not really, not at the moment that I know of. Uh, we have a heritage committee, but unfortunately, you know, the, the flip side of it is that some of the buildings are in such a bad condition. If you, if you can walk along that road where you can see this part here and just look at uh, these two buildings here, Bible building and, uh, you know, Bedwar building, they're in a very, very bad condition. Now, to restore these buildings would cost a significant chunk of money. In England, you know what they do? They break the back of the building, but they keep the facade up. They, they sort of prop it up, and then they build an entire building behind it. Maybe we could do something like that, but nobody has tried it. But no, no, litigation only that York House, they tried for York building, but the the High Court ruled very clearly that it was too dangerous and too dilapidated. I wish they had maintained the facade. The facade was very, very beautiful. But no, nobody is doing anything. And these are private buildings. Remember that. The landlords are not getting rents. They don't have the money to do it. Um, you can't sell them easily. And also the leases are up already. If you've seen around South Bombay, there are these big boards collector of Bombay, this was released mm. in this and this year for this month. So the collector is waiting to increase property tax on these buildings. A lot of the leases are over now. 75 year leases, 99 year leases are gone. It's only yeah. the 999 year ones that remain. Yeah. Right. Uh, an added question from Suyash was that, uh, is your thesis available for purchase or available? <laughs> Um, no, but it is online. Uh, the, the university has uh, something called Shod Ganga. So it is on that. Yes. All theses are uploaded to that. Okay. So you could find it there. Okay. Uh, another question that comes in from uh, Neha, that what were the provisions made in Fairdown to fight the epidemic of uh, the bubonic plague? Ah, it's pretty much nothing here. 
it was still quite widely open. It was, um, if you remember by 1898, not everything had been built up. It was still, there were still open spaces. And this is, uh, if you realize it, the, the elite part of town. The problems were in the more crushed part of town. So you're further north in the native, uh, you know, town. And of course, what is now Princess Street. So, you know, the idea, that's how the Princess Street uh, development comes up. The Bombay Improvement Trust breaks down all those uh, you know, houses that are tightly clustered there to create this large open road that will carry air into the tighter fort areas. But I have not come across very much here, barring the fact that some people couldn't pay, finish paying their uh, the rents due to them on the leases because of the plague business had stalled. That's all. Nothing very much else. All right. Uh, another question that's coming from Gitanjali. Given that the plots were sold in such a methodical manner, uh, have you found that there are a lot of property disputes in the area? They weren't really sold in a very methodical manner, actually, at all. If you just look at the numbering also over here on this map itself, they're all quite uh, haywire. Numbers change frequently. I'm sure there are property disputes in this area. I haven't really done any kind of work on legal disputes at the current time. But um, if there were disputes at that time, then it was addressed straight away to government and people didn't really take, I mean, some people might have taken it to court, but I haven't come across any large cases here. There were cases in other parts of Freetown, particularly the area where the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, etc. are, but not over here. No, I haven't come across anything in my research. Okay, great. Uh, last two questions, uh, one being from Keva, and he wanted to just clarify. Uh, the Gymkhana chambers, did they belong to the Bombay Gym? No, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. But it overlooks the Bombay Gymkhana. Therefore, I think uh, it was called Gymkhana chambers. It belonged to the Tatas. Um, now, of course, it's Srinivas house. And if you actually go to the, you know, you walk um, around the back part of it here. If you look at this wall, it still looks like the old wall. So I suspect that the Srinivas building came up around the old Gymkhana chambers. It's a very ugly building now over there. Sorry to say. But no, it was just named Gymkhana Chambers because it overlooked the Bombay Gymkhana. It didn't have anything to do with Gymkhana, the Bombay Gymkhana. One more question came in. Uh, which are the buildings that have the 999 years lease? JB Pettit School. Ah. <laughs> um, pretty much nobody else has it. Because oh. even the um, cathedral schools, when they were given out uh, the, uh, afterwards, got a 99-year leases for that property. Because uh, the directors in London decided, uh, I mean, government in London decided 999 years was a bit too long. So, but J.B. Pettit is the only one that I know of that still has it. And the last one is from Ashwin and his favorite topic is, what's the story behind the name Atma Singh, Jaisa Singh, Banke Bihari? I have no idea. I'm so sorry, Ashwin. I should have checked on this one. I'm so sorry. I have no idea. <laughs> Do you know, Vinayak, why Atma Singh, Jaisa Singh, Banke no, no, Who it, is it, Atma Singh, Jaisa Singh, Banke Bihari? We should look it up. Yeah. Sorry, Ashwin. Yeah, it took me a while to even remember the name. So... Um, Sorry, there's just one more that's coming from uh, Commander Narayan is uh, during Robert Grant's watch, there was a medical college set up in the near vicinity of uh, today's VT. Would you be knowing about its location? No, I have not come across anything like that. Um, what I have come across, it's not a medical college. This, this plot number 68 here was going to be um, a, a sort of residential sort of hostel for the nurses of JJ hospital. That's all I know. I haven't really come across any medical college. Um, perhaps something might have been decided where the European hospital was going up, which is now, of course, at the back near VT. Yeah. But no, I haven't seen anything. But then, uh, Commander Narayan, sorry, I, I was concentrating more on this side of Hornby Road than on that side. So, sorry. All right. I think uh, that's basically it. Uh, just one, I think, comment came in. If uh, Perina wanted to know who owns the land of the cathedral schools now, all land is owned by government. All land in this part of town. Okay, sorry, I should. In this part of town is owned by government. Um, it's only leased out. There's there's no private property at all. So now it would, I suspect, be under the port trust or the it's collector's land. One of the two. All right. Great. So, I think Port Trust is uh, all the reclaimed land is Port Trust and this is collector's land. Okay, uh, somebody's asked, can the government take it back? Uh, I assume so. 
they are trying they have uh, in the recent past they have tried to push up uh, the property taxes quite a bit um, the, it's in court even at the moment uh, fighting against the high you know taxation if the taxes go up i am very worried this entire area will disappear they will keep the big buildings they'll keep the high court and the you know all those buildings but uh, these these will go these are private buildings nobody really cares about this i mean if in delhi you can remove our <laughs> buildings over there and have a new vista what's stopping us doing it here so yeah yeah it can go terrifying thought but i am sorry i think we'll uh, stop with the questions in case you want to ask any further questions to dr poncha can out to her uh, as well because i'm sure there's this such a vast topic to uh, you know delve into and thank you so much for taking out the time for this session i think it was great uh, for all of us to be able to get to know this uh, you know a lot more in detail thank you very much it was my pleasure Thank you.